Okay, so I hope you reviewed uh, an act potential or nerve impulse from chapter 11. Now we are uh, going to move on to the nerve muscle relationship. So here we're going to look at how muscles contract. All right, so here we're going to start off with what is known as a motor unit. A motor unit is a nerve fiber or an axon and all the muscle fibers innervated by it. Okay, so here is showing one in blue, it's coming out all the blue uh, muscle fibers, and then another motor unit in red coming out all, to all the red ones here. All right, so um, these muscle fibers are typically dispersed throughout a muscle, so they're not on one side or the other. So if we stimulate that one motor uh, unit, we're going to get a, um, a kind of a weak contraction in that muscle. Now, obviously, the more motor units we involve there, the stronger the contraction is going to be. Now, the range on this is anywhere from three uh, motor, uh, motor uh, so three muscle fibers to upwards of a thousand muscle fibers per motor neuron. All right. So this area right here, where the uh, axon makes an interaction with that muscle cell, is known as the neuromuscular junction. So this is a region where a motor neuron comes into contact with a skeletal muscle cell, all right? So just like what we saw before though, when we went from neuron to neuron, what we're seeing here is uh, that that axon is not directly connected to that uh, muscle cell. So this is what we see here, there's a blow up of this, we have a small space there, uh, which is known as the synaptic cleft again. So this area right here is known as the motor end plate, and so there's a trough-like part of a muscle fiber sarcolemma. So it kind of dips down a little bit in that area. It's at the motor end plate. Okay? So when an impulse moves down an axon uh, of the motor neuron, that impulse um, is going to secrete a neurotransmitter, just like what we talked about before back in Chapter 11, uh, at the end of the axon. And this neurotransmitter is a chemical that's going to stimulate a muscle fiber to contract. Now this neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. All right, uh, that's going to cross the synaptic cleft, and we're going to see it cause a contraction on the next cell. Now, we go to the next picture here, showing a little more in depth on this. Within the synaptic cleft is an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. And acetylcholine esterase is going to break down that acetylcholine, because if it stays in there, uh, it's going to continue to cause a contraction. Now, what acetylcholine actually binds to are acetylcholine receptors. Uh, on the muscle cell, uh, and they're going to cause uh, a nerve impulse on that muscle cell. So let's take a look at the behavior of skeletal muscles. So the first part here is called excitation. So this is a process in which action potentials in the nerve fiber lead to action potentials on a muscle fiber. All right. So we talked about like synaptic transmission back in chapter 11. It's the same thing here. So, when an action potential reaches the end of an axon, it's going to cause calcium ions to diffuse uh, these calcium ion channels to open, and this allows calcium to diffuse into the end of that axon. Then uh, those calcium ions are going to uh, cause a stimulate, uh, are going to stimulate the uh, release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. All right, uh, acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft. And then it's going to bind to these, so, uh, these acetylcholine receptors on the, on the muscle cell, or on the sarcolemma. Uh, and then that's going to allow uh, sodium to diffuse in. And this starts an action potential on the sarcolemma of that muscle cell. Okay. The next part is excitation contraction coupling. So these action potentials, sodium diffusing in, potassium diffusing out, stuff we've talked about before. These action potentials are going to move across the sarcolemma, and then they're going to move down a T-tubule. All right? And this is going to, so if you remember, the sarcoplasmic reticulum lies on either side of those T-tubules. So when that impulse moves down the T-tubule, it's going to stimulate the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. All right? So those calcium ions go into the sarcoplasm, and they're going to bind to troponin. All right? So they're going to bind to a troponin. Now, if I were to grab something, so here's a pen, and I grab that pen, I have to change the shape of my hand to grab that pen. 
And that's what's gonna happen here. So when troponin grabs onto calcium, that's gonna change the shape of the troponin tropomyosin complex shape, all right? And so what this does is this opens up the active site on the, uh, on the actin, and this will allow the myosin to bind to the actin, okay? So previously, so this is here we are prior to calcium binding. So here the tropomyosin is blocking the active site on the actin. Calcium binds to it. So the tropomyosin is now out of the way. Myosin can now bind to the active site on the actin. All right, let's look at uh, contraction. So let's look at this. In the head of the myosin, all right, an ATP molecule has already brought, been broken down. This causes the head of the, uh, of the uh, head of the myosin to move forward. So this is in the forward position. It still has the ADP and the phosphate bound to it. So when you break down ATP, it gets broken down into ADP and a phosphate and it releases energy. All right. So here, the ADP and the phosphate are still bound. So what's going to happen next is that head is going to attach to the active site on the actin. And this creates what is known as a cross bridge. It'll release the phosphate when that occurs. All right, next is the myosin is gonna release the ADP and then it flexes. So, you know, here it is, grabs, pulls, all right? So when it pulls on this, all right? So when it pulls, all right, uh, it's gonna pull on that actin myofilament. This is known as the power stroke and that's gonna shorten the sarcomere. So let's go back a couple of pictures here. So it, we're grabbing, we're pulling in both directions here, with the wrong direction. So it's grabbing and pulling in both directions. And so those Z-discs are gonna get closer together. So that's gonna shorten that sarcomere up, all right? So that's what's gonna happen there. So grabs, pulls, that's a power stroke, pulls. At the same time, it releases that ADP. So that's what contraction is there. So, the myosin, though, is going to remain bound to that actin until a new ATP molecule binds to it. So that's what we see in the next picture. So ATP binds, now that myosin can release, all right? Then that new ATP is broken down, all right? And uh, it releases the actin, and then it moves forward. And this is known as a recovery stroke. So when it breaks down ATP, it moves forward back again, and now it's in a position to re-grab, okay? So when we look at this, so now it's in a position to re-grab. So, and now we can start all over again, all right? So when we look at this, right, calcium binds to troponin, changes to troponin tropomyosin complex shape. This allows the myosin to bind to the actin. The, actin, uh, the myosin is gonna grab onto the actin, pull on it, bringing those Z-discs closer together. Now, only half of these myosin are bound at any one time, all right? So it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you pull a rope with two hands, you can do this two ways. You can grab, pull, grab, pull. That's not what happened. What we're doing here is hand over hand pulling, all right? So half are bound, grabbing, pulling, while the other half are recocking, ready to grab, pull, and so on. So that is contraction right there, all right? Now in relaxation, we gotta go back. So in relaxation, what's gonna happen in relaxation is a nerve signal stops. So since the nerve signal stops, we're not releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft anymore, all right? So any acetylcholine that's in there is gonna get broken down by acetylcholine esterase. Oh, by the way, just on a side note, in tetanus, tetanus releases a chemical that interferes with acetylcholine esterase. So you don't break down acetylcholine. So acetylcholine stays there, and this is what keeps the muscle contracted. All right, so, uh, you know, if you get clostridium tetani, the bacteria. Anyway, back to this. All right, so because there's no acetylcholine anymore, we're not gonna have an, uh, an action potential along the sarcolemma. If there's no action potential along the sarcolemma, there's no impulse moving down the T-tubules. So, when that impulse moved down the T tubules, that causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium ions into the sarcoplasm. So that's not occurring anymore. So now what we do is we pump 
calcium ions back into the sarcoplasm by active transport. That actually requires energy. All right? And so now, since there's no calcium, we can go back. We go from this picture down here to this one here by removing calcium. Now the troponin tropomyosin complex shape uh, complex moves back into its position, and that prevents the myosin from binding to the actin anymore. All right? And the last part here is that these filaments slide back to their original positions. And the reason that that occurs, that these filaments go back to their original positions, and I should move this picture to a different place, all right, is on this picture here, you see like this little thing called Titan. You can see it's a, a spring. So as these Z-discs get closer together, Titan gets, you know, squished. And so, you know, when the myosin releases the actin, Titan pushes them back to their original position. All right, let's take a look at uh, rigor mortis. So rigor mortis is where a muscle stays contracted uh, after death. And so here, there's a couple places that we use energy here uh, in relaxation. So first off, there's no energy uh, available to pump the calcium in, back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, because when you're dead, you're not making energy anymore. And so now, because it takes energy to keep that calcium in, now that calcium just simply diffuses out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's going to bind to the uh, troponin. That will cause the troponin tropomyosin complex shape to change. All right, so then the myosin now uh, grabs onto the actin and it pulls on it once. All right. But what we need now is we need ATP. We need ATP to bind to that myosin head to release the actin. Well, there's no ATP available, so it stays bound, all right? So if you die in the fetal position, you know, rigor mortis sets in, you'll be in that fetal position for a little bit, all right? So, you know, because that myosin is still bound to that actin, that muscle stays contracted. Now your muscles will uh, loosen up after a few days. You'll secrete your own enzymes, which we store in lysosomes, will start to break you down as well. Uh, but then bacterial action will start working on you and you'll loosen back up again.